I'm Joe Donnelly, and I was proud to represent the great state of Indiana in the United States Senate and to co-found the One Country Project with my good friend, Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Over the next three days, we'll address issues facing rural America, ranging from health care to the future of work in rural America, how the changing demographics of rural America can potentially change the electoral landscape, how the issue of online disinformation is being addressed, and so much more. We'll have guest speakers, including Sister Simone Campbell, Whitney Kimball Coe, David Axelrod, and Mitch Landrew, just to name a few. Since I know many of you watching today are new to the One Country Project, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the work we do. We started the One Country Project in 2019 as we realized that rural America had increasingly become a place where only one party had a real chance to win most of the elections. The One Country Project has been working to reopen that dialogue with rural communities, to rebuild trust and respect, and to hold elected leaders accountable to the needs of rural residents. Over the last few years, we've become a critical resource for emerging leaders working to represent rural America and to ensure our country, which we all love so much, is pursuing a policy agenda that doesn't leave rural America behind. Our relationship with rural residents won't be repaired overnight, but it can be mended. That starts with reopening the dialogue with rural Americans. If we continue to focus only on policy and electoral effort aimed only at urban and suburban areas, elections in rural areas will remain uncompetitive. One country works to promote rural needs and perspectives through many outlets, and they include releasing overviews of the rural economy and rural health care crisis to make sure the public and policymakers understand that they understand what's going on in rural communities, helping the rest of the country to listen to and understand rural America by publishing the first in a series of reviews of the rural media landscape, advocating for inclusion of rural infrastructure priorities like flood response and school construction in any major infrastructure package. We also maintain active communications through multiple channels. Every Monday, we send weekly talking points to a network of local activists, surrogates, and national thought leaders, giving weekly message advice and highlighting the most important priorities from a rural perspective. The Hot Dish Podcast, of course, which, which we've all, so many of us have been a part of um, over the past few years. And you can follow us on Twitter, at underscore one country, underscore, or on Facebook at One Country Project. I would also like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors who have helped to make this Rural Progress Summit possible. Our first topic of the day is a really, really critical one. How do we deliver the best health care for rural America? And I can't think of a better person to lead that than our one country board member and the minority leader of the Alabama State House, Anthony Daniels. Um, Anthony, over to you. Thank you, Senator Donnelly. It's always good to, to be with you. Um, and, and thank you for the work that you uh, continue to do. Uh, even uh, after uh, the Senate, you've certainly been an advocate across the country for rural communities and communities in general. So we want to thank you for what you do and thank you for leading the fight. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. I'm Anthony Daniels and I serve as the Alabama House Minority Leader, as well as a member, uh, a board member for the One Country Project. I'm excited to mo moderate this important discussion on how we can provide the best health care for rural communities across America. Over the past year and a half, the pandemic has tested us in a number of ways and illuminated flaws in our established systems 
particularly our rural health care system. The U.S. Census Bureau found that approximately 60 million Americans live in rural areas, and rural health care systems are faced with unique challenges compared to those urban counterparts during the pandemic. Whether it be the cost of or access issues due to the ge geographical barriers, financial constraints, the need to travel long distances to facilities, the lack of internet access, and the general lack of trust in our healthcare system and receiving quality care, or workforce shortages, there's been a cl clear issues that need to be addressed if we are to truly deliver the best health care for Americans and rural communities across the nation. And so we have a great panel here today to discuss these important issues. And so I'll begin by introducing our first panelist, Dr. Richard Powers. Dr. Powers is a renowned psychiatrist and neuropathologist who practiced psychiatry at the University of Alabama School of Medicine and has served as the medical director for the Alabama Department of Mental Health as an associate chief of staff to geriatrics and extended care at the Veterans Administration Healthcare System. Dr. Powers has been involved in numerous public policy initiatives at the local, state, and national levels and have been inducted into the Alabama Health Healthcare Hall of Fame and received the Nathan Davis Award presented by AMA in 2011 for public service provided at the state level. He is an author of numerous book chapters, scholarly publications, and consumer education programs that focus on diseases and disorders and was one of the founding members of the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. He cur he's currently practicing at the University of Alabama as an adjunct, adjunct professor in the Department of Pathology, as well as a medical director of Behavior Health for Viva Inc. This panel will also include former uh, Governor John Kitzhaber with Modium Health, Sean Robbins with Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. John Weston, and Aidan O'Connor. Aidan O'Connor is a critical care flight paramedic. He was also elected in 2015 as a county legislator and was appointed chairperson of the health care committee and elected minority leader in New York. Aidan will tell us a bit about the SOAR and AIR methods and jumpstart our discussion on how to provide the best health care for rural America. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from across the country. It is uh, truly an honor. As you mentioned, uh, I spent 95% of my professional and personal life uh, in rural America, where I reside today and still work today. So I'm privileged to speak on behalf of SOAR, our Saving Our Air Medical Resources, which is a national campaign dedicated to preserving these air medical services across America and also air methods for the company that I currently work in. So in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, what I hope to tell you all is what is the impact of air medical services across our country, particularly in our rural environments? And then also uh, what pandemic 19 response that we did and, and lived up to to help support our local hospitals. And then we're gonna get into some of the threats that we have facing us and challenges that we face of putting these air medical resources out and about in rural America. And I'll conclude today uh, with just some of our goals going forward and a personal story that I thought about when I was uh, told about this summit that I think could put the whole picture together on how air medical does help our, our communities. So we can go to the next slide. And this is where we begin on what is air medical transport? And you know we partner oftentimes with police, fire, EMS, and our local hospitals. And they're the ones who have kind of termed us as the flying emergency rooms and flying ICUs. And that's because the majority of air medical programs across the country have both a critical care paramedic and a critical care flight nurse, um, both of which come into our profession with a vast amount of experience and knowledge. And then they take that even further. Um, they're able to do advanced pharmacology, advanced equipment, they have advanced tools. So no matter where you live in America, when you know a helicopter's landing to help you or a loved one or a member of your community, they are literally bringing the ER and ICU to you. 
The reason that this is so absolutely important is because the data speaks for itself. Uh, since 2010, 138 rural hospitals have closed. There are another 800 rural hospitals that are at risk of closing. So nearby where I live, we had a small hospital with about 10 beds and two ICU beds who recently converted over to an urgent care. And I'll never forget the fear and anxiety that was on the faces uh, of those in the community when they heard that the hospital was moving into an urgent care and closing. The only way we were able to alleviate that is we did bring them down the road to the airport and showed them the helicopter with the ER and ICU level skills and people inside that helicopter. And you saw that immediately have a little reduction of anxiety. Um, the other reason is not just that one community I'm speaking of, there's 85 million Americans that live more than an hour from a level one or level two trauma center if driven by ambulance, a staggering statistic. Even more so to add on though, there's 32 million Americans left that live with uh, more than an hour from a trauma center, even when an air ambulance is in their community. So now more than ever, it, it's essential to have these resources out and about because when the ER is not there, the air ambulance is there to take care of the loved ones in their community. So that's how we've been operating for the last 10 years. When we go to the next slide, you know, certainly the pandemic being at the forefront of all of our minds is the COVID-19 pandemic. And how did air ambulance respond to that? Well, the way that we responded is um, just in the last year and a half, if you think about that small hospital I told you about, we all heard on CNN, we all heard in the newspapers, you'll see on your screen on the slide, uh, the different news reports that were put out there. Um, during that, these hospitals became overloaded with patients, right? So even that rural hospital with seven beds now had 14 patients and only seven beds left. The way that we were able to help the healthcare system was we're able to go in and it was kind of twofold. One, the COVID patients were sicker than sick. They were the sickest patients I've ever seen in my, my clinical career. They required ventilators, which we have on every helicopter. They required uh, advanced pharmacology, which we have on every helicopter. So we needed the helicopters to move these sick patients. The other thing is we had to move them even further. So during the COVID pandemic, we saw that these hospitals, if they were packed, typically the next hospital down the road, the next town or village or city over was also packed. So we found ourselves was in via helicopter or by plane, we were moving these patients across the state, even across state lines, and sometimes even a, across multiple state lines. Uh, and we could not have done that without the air medical response. And I will say the community applauded, they heard it. So over half of voters agree that ambulances, air ambulances were a central part of the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, if it gives you a scope of it, in 2020, the most common diagnosis associated with air transports shifted to chronic respiratory disease and COVID-19. Um, so even just air methods alone, we transport over 6,000 COVID patients to date. And I wanna mention a safety topic with that, which is we never had a COVID-19 infection go from the patient to our flight crews because our flight crews from top to bottom were wearing full gear, N95 masks, goggles, and we had a very vigorous decon process to make sure that COVID-19 did not spread in, within the helicopter or within any one community. And I'll just tell you a quick story. I, I had the opportunity to be boots on the ground during the New York City surge. And there's two things I took away from that. One is these crews, you know, they do monumental feats day by day before the pandemic. But then to see them get off a helicopter fully gowned with the equipment that, you know, even more advanced equipment than we needed for the sickest patients we've ever seen, what I found was it was amazing that they always reported back. We were, we were transporting 10, 15 patients per day, and they would get off the helicopter and say, who's next? How can we help? Um, so these first responders were dedicated. The other thing I took away from that is watching doctors and nurses within the hospital. They got to spend overnight shifts with them crying because every patient that left a facility during COVID meant it was hope for one more patient who could get that one other ventilator, who could have that one more uh, treatment uh, in their hospital. So see that level of, of passion in our healthcare system and how Air Medical will contribute to that is something that will stick with me forever. We can go to the next slide, please. So you hear about what we do in rural America day by day, how we did that with COVID-19, but there are some challenges, right? We, we want helicopters out and about in all these rural communities because they are essential life-saving. Uh, unfortunately, unsustainable reimbursement rates are threatening us and challenging us every day with where we can place these helicopters and survive. Uh, to give you an idea, Medicare only covers about 50% of the transport costs. Uh, it has been two decades since we were able to reevaluate the reimbursement rates for air ambulance transports. 
And Medicaid covers even less. And in some states, only 4% of the total transport. I've sat across the desk of elected officials in certain states who have done the calculation and said, do we even reimburse you enough for the fuel to bring a patient from our local hospital to the city hospital? And when they did the math, it, it barely covered the fuel, never mind the aircraft, the flight crew, and the bases that we have, and all the fixed costs that go along with that. So overall, about 75% of emergency air transports are either Medicare, Medicaid, or other government insurance. So three out of four of our patients. So you can only imagine uh, it's an uphill feat when it comes to a business plan. The No Surprise Act rulemaking, uh, first and foremost, is the most recent legislation that's impacting the air medical world. And, and we'd say that we wholeheartedly agree with it because it removes patients uh, from that bill, that surprise billing, and it redirects uh, the cost back to negotiation with uh, whether it's be insurance or government reimbursement. However, the implementation of these rules issued by HHS and other agencies have misguided and threatened the industry, and they are considered unique characteristics of all ambulance uh, providers and the rural safety network that we're providing in this essential service. In particular, the rules set out in the process for negotiating reimbursement for independent air ambulance services that artificially compress the reimbursement and give health plans to unfair playing fields. Specifically, the HHS has failed to account for material differences between independent air ambulance providers who are predominantly in the rural communities who go out and make sure that we are stationed next to those places that used to have hospitals or hospitals that are closing, and compare us to hospital-based air ambulance providers. Yet there's precedence for such distinct distinction in same regulation. Um, so overall, what we're asking for is that we go back and ensure that the rules do not impede us uh, from being out and about, even growing into communities who are asking for us to join them here today. I, we did add this last bullet in here, which is the industry is struggling to find these specialized flight nurses and flight paramedics. Before the pandemic, it was a, a mild uh, challenge for us to even recruit and then have those individuals go out and live in some of these rural uh, environments. As many of you will talk about during the summit in the next few hours and days to come, we are seeing some significant challenges when it comes to uh, trying to get both pilots, nurses, and paramedics uh, into the system. So we look forward to hearing some best practices and lessons learned from all of you. And certainly if we find any, uh, we'll do the same. So we can go to the next slide, please. So moving right along, um, you know, when we when we talk about coverage overall, uh, you know, people see us, they see us on the side of the road, they see us on the highways, and 88% of voters agree that health insurance should cover these services such as surgery and emergency services. And the voters also overwhelmingly support air medical as an essential life-saving service on Americans in rural environments. And you can see this picture that was taken, you know, whether it's on a highway, whether it's going to the local hospital or even attending local fairs and events, uh, we're certainly out about and they recognize and we have testimonials galore of people who are impacted, whether a decreased mortality or decreased morbidity out in our rural parts of America. And when we go to our last slide, I'll, I'll summarize some of the goals that we have for because, you know, hopefully what you take away is you hear how essential this is, right? With, you know, Anthony Daniels mentioned at the opening of this that, you know, these long transport times, these long, you know, hospitals closing, EMS, our ground EMS partners are suffering uh, both in the volunteer and the paid portions of it. So we are destined that we have to confront these challenges that threaten us head on. So that way we could have uh, these services out about for the next years to come. So our goals, the last slide today is that we urge the Department of Health and Human Services to collect cost data from, that provides to help spur accurate reimbursement rates. Uh, we mentioned the Medicaid, Medicare, we're asking for the reimbursement rates to uh, be increased and, and look at the cost data to prove that that needs to be increased over two decades. Uh, we encourage large insurance to bring providers in network. We, we want to be at the table. We want to remove the patient from the bill. We want to give them time to heal, reduce their anxiety of all the bills that they're getting, and also ensure a final rule for No Surprise Act that is fair and maintains a patient access to air medical services by recognizing the difference between air medical provider types. And I'll conclude here. We could certainly close down the slide deck if you'd like, but a story when I was asked about the summit and I read about your mission, uh, one of the, the calls that came to mind was one of the last flights I did as a flight paramedic before moving into a leadership role was an individual in very rural America. Uh, he was going to bed that night and unfortunately collapsed with a massive heart attack and his heart stopped and he stopped breathing. Uh, the individual's family started CPR, local first responders came and, and provided uh, CPR and they stayed on scene for about 45 minutes trying to get this man back to life. And when he finally got his heartbeat back and started breathing, 
they had a choice to go to a local hospital, which is 20 minutes away, or the larger facility that he ultimately had to be at, which is about an hour and a half. So they chose to bring him to the small community hospital to stabilize him. And that's when they activated air medical. And we arrived. He was a, a very sick individual to the point that his heartbeat couldn't beat on itself. So we had to use a machine that a lot of small hospitals don't have in our rural communities to actually keep his heart alive for the transport to the larger facility, which would have taken about an hour, hour and a half transport. We were able to get there in 17 minutes. But the two things I remember most is we were flying over the farm that night. We were flying all of these farm fields and these houses. And I grew up in a, in a farmhouse. And I remember thinking it's pitch dark and it's the middle of the night, about 3 a.m., and how amazing is it that, you know, we're flying over these farm fields with a flying ICU bringing this patient to a facility that otherwise, if he did not make it there, uh, would have died. And the second thing I took from it is the individual uh, reflected. He looked like Santa Claus. And oftentimes in the ER room, they would say he looks like Santa Claus. And I didn't understand the connection. And I got to meet this individual a few months later, uh, fully recovered back in uh, to the community. And he gave me a big hug with tears in his eyes and said to me, if it wasn't for the helicopter and getting me to this hospital to get what I needed, uh, he said, I'm the local Santa Claus for the town. And who would have been Santa Claus for these kids? And who would have continued the charity work that he was doing with his local church? And I, you know, I keep thinking to myself when I, when I look at, you know, where we're placing air medical resources and, and the work that we do every day, uh, that's why we wake up in the morning. That's why we do it. And it goes from everything from the time that we're called, making sure we have a base there, all the way to reimbursement, making sure that we're reimbursed so that way we can go back to work the next day and open more bases. So I'll conclude with that. But thank you so much for the time. And I look forward to uh, any questions that may come either now or during the panel later today. Well, thank you, Aiden. That was a very powerful message and wonderful information um, that you shared. And so we hope, uh, you know, that we have conferences like this to figure out how, uh, as policymakers, as community leaders, and, and, and how we are able to move our, how to move our country forward and, and, and create these best practices in all across America. So thank you for sharing that information. Um, now uh, we'll turn it over to former Governor uh, John Kitzsaber. But before uh, John come on, I'm going to tell you a little bit about his work and the things that he's done across the country uh, during his time as governor, as well as currently. John is a doctor and a former governor of Oregon who, during his third term as, as governor, was the chief architect of the Oregon's Coordinated Care Organization, the first effort in the country created on the statewide basis to meet the triple aim, better health, better quality, and lower costs, with a focus on community and population health. Over the course of five years, this new care model enrolled over 385,000 more people under the ACA Medicaid expansion, maintained benefits, quality, and outcomes, and held medical inflation to just 3.4% per member per year for a, a cumulative total fund saving of over $1.1 billion. He currently works with Modem Health and is going to discuss the work of Modem Health and doing the advance uh, in the advanced rural health care system. So without further ado, I introduce to some, present to others, uh, former Governor John Kitzhaber. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to participate uh, today. I just wanted to check and see if my PowerPoint ever arrived. No word on that? Okay, I'm going to assume I don't have it. Oh, oh, here we go. Bye, guys. It's there. Is there, there. magic? All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, what I want to talk about uh, is basically this new care model, and particularly how I think it can offer an answer to many uh, parts of rural America, particularly those that are struggling uh, with their with their hospitals that have been under stress. And we know the importance of rural hospitals to rural to rural communities. Uh, I'm only going to take about 10 minutes. I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion, but I, I first want to provide a larger context for this healthcare issue that we're struggling with today. Um, as was just mentioned, I lived for 14 years in a, in a rural timber dependent community in Southwest Oregon. I represented that community uh, in the Oregon legislature. And for most of that time, I was practicing emergency medicine in our, in our local community hospital. And those experiences gave me a, a, an acute appreciation of the importance and the challenge and the depth of the challenge of, of facing rural America, in particular, the challenge of, of getting access to a quality, affordable health care. 
you know, and it also gave me an appreciation of, of the so-called urban-rural divide, uh, of the long-standing economic struggle that's been the daily experience of many people living in rural America, and that sense of isolation from political power centers that are often located in more urban parts uh, of the country. And I think that sense of isolation and frustration, really, uh, has contributed to the deep divisions within our nation. That's certainly been true in, in Oregon. If I could have the next slide. Um, Oregon is not uh, an exception. Um, if you advance that slide there, if you could. Uh, am I supposed to be advancing these? I was told that you guys were going to do it better. Thanks very much. Uh, I just think it's kind of interesting to note that on our national electoral map, Oregon has always show us, has shown us this bright blue island floating in a sea of red. But if you look at Oregon from a county electoral map, uh, it is as red as the rest of the nation. So the point is that I think this rural summit, this summit on rural progress is, is particularly relevant coming as it does at a time when, you know, we have allowed ourselves to become defined by our differences where our politics has become very reactive and very transactional. And I have to tell you that uh, this environment feels very familiar to me. I came in age of age in the 1960s. I turned 21 in, in 1960, uh, 1968, which was a time very similar to the time we're facing today. Those of you who are old enough to remember will remember that it was a time also of deep division in our country, a time of anger and alienation. We had civil unrest at home and an unpopular war abroad. And what I've learned over the intervening 50 years is that the prescription for this kind of unraveling of the fabric of our society, I think, is to rebuild our sense of community and common purpose through a shared vision of the future, something that we can all believe in, something bigger than ourselves, something that we're all willing to invest in and even sacrifice for. You know, if I could have the next slide, please. And I think that after practicing medicine for 15 years in rural Oregon, actually, there was one right before that, I think. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, that's me. No wrinkles, no gray hair. Uh, after practicing in, in, a, in a small, tight-knit rural community, uh, I I've come to believe that the future of our healthcare system offers us that common purpose that we're looking for. And I think the simple reason is that all of us ultimately share uh, a, a, a common mortality. Uh, all of us are going to grow old. Uh, all of us at some point are going to need medical care to help us maintain our health. Uh, all of us will cling to our lives and to the lives of those that we love. And at that point, this is not a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. There's no partisan solution. There's only one that recognizes that we're all in this together, that we all share the same brief moment of life, and that all of us, no matter where we live, deserve access to quality, affordable health care. And I can tell you that, you know, during the 15 years that I practiced in the ER, I can't remember a single instance when I checked someone's party registration before I treated them, or I can't remember ever wondering whether Democrats believe different, believe different than Republicans or whether cancer, a cardiovascular disease, respects partisanship and, and political ideology. And it seems to me that if we, can, if we can recognize and build on that, then I think we have a chance uh, to put our country back together. What I wanna to talk to you specifically about today is this care model that was alluded to earlier, the Oregon <clears throat> Coordinated Care Organization that we've been pioneering now since 2012. And it has proved not only very, very beneficial to rural parts of our state, but I think equally important, it's give people throughout Oregon in urban parts of the state, as well as rural parts of the state, something to work on together, which to me is the first step uh, in rebuilding community. Uh, next slide. So this, uh, this CCO model uh, emerged from the Great Recession when Oregon, like many other states, was facing a huge budget deficit. In our, in our state, about 1.2 billion of that was in the Medicaid program. And it became very clear that in order to balance the budget, we were going to have to drop tens of thousands of people from coverage uh, or uh, cut provider reimbursement rates by up to 40%. Uh, instead, we decided to focus on the delivery system and see whether we could figure out a way to get more value for each dollar spent um, in, terms of, of, uh, in terms of healthcare. Uh, next slide. So the result was this, uh, this new organization, coordinated care organizations. They are community-based organizations. They have a local governance structure uh, involving local citizens as well as providers. And they're designed to move away from the narrow medical model and focus more broadly on community health, recognizing that many of the things that bring people to the hospital are, are issues that exist in the larger community, housing issues and food insecurity and things of that nature. They also operate on a capitated payment model with a value-based global budget that's linked to a sustainable uh, growth rate. 
So in March of 2012, the legislation passed that set up these organizations. And it's important to note that at that time, there was deep division in the United States Congress, but this bill passed with broad bipartisan support. The House of Representatives, which at that time was split 30-30 between Republicans and Democrats, passed the bill by a vote of 53 to seven, which I think is instructive. By that time, though, it was clear that even if we could save a lot of money with this new care model, we wouldn't realize the savings quick enough to fill the budget hole that we were facing in the 2011-2013 biennium. Uh, next slide. So in May of that year, I went to Washington, D.C., and we were able to convince the Obama administration to give us the 1115 waivers necessary to use this new care model to provide care to our our uh, Medicaid population, and to secure $1.9 billion one-time five-year investment to help us move from the old care model to the new one, in exchange for a commitment to reduce the Medicaid trend line by 2% by the end of the second year of the waiver, from 5.4% down to 3.4% uh, per member per year, with no reduction in enrollment and no reduction in benefits, and while meeting rigorous uh, uh, metrics around access, quality, uh, and, and outcomes. Uh, next slide. So in the first five years of the waiver, which ended in July, I believe, of 2017, and we just, uh, we just discussed this in the, in, in the introduction, the state actually operated within the constraints of that 3.4% per member per year growth rate. We enrolled another 385,000 people uh, during the ACA Medicaid expansion. <clears throat> All of the CECOs met the outcome and quality requirements. Uh, we paid back the $1.9 billion loan and realized a cumulative total fund savings of over a billion dollars, which at least pre-COVID is projected to reach about 8.6 billion uh, by, um, uh, by, uh, by within, within a decade. So today, 25% of Oregonians and 60% of our children and the majority of people in rural parts of the state are now covered uh, by, this, uh, by this care model. So now I wanna turn for just a few minutes and talk about one of our most successful CCOs, which is the Eastern Oregon CCO, which I think will illustrate why this might be something of interest uh, to rural communities in, in other parts of the country. Uh, next slide, please. Eastern Oregon CCO, it, it's, it's all that orange part of this slide here, uh, has about 55,000 members and they're scattered across 12 rural counties that compromise about half or comprise about half the geographic region of the state. So it's a huge rural area in, uh, with, with, with 12 counties. Uh, next slide, please. This CCO is organized uh, as a limited liability corporation that has eight partners, Amoda Health, which is a commercial insurance company, the Greater Oregon Behavioral uh, Health uh, Inc., which was initially established to administer the behavioral health benefit for Medicaid, uh, a migrant farm worker clinic in Yakima, the Eastern Oregon Independent Practice Association, and four uh, rural hospitals. Uh, next slide. So we all know that rural hospitals um, are not only important healthcare providers, but they're very, very important community institutions, and they're also important uh, local employers. And because in many parts of a rural America, they don't see the kind of consistent volume that we see in more urban or suburban parts of the state, the, the old volume-based fee-for-service reimbursement model makes them particularly vulnerable economically, particularly during downturns when there's a, a reduction in, in volume, which we just went through, of course, because of the cancellation of elective surgeries during the COVID pandemic. So for that reason, this new capitated payment model in a, in a value-based global budget that's used for the CCOs has offered them a degree of stability and a degree of revenue certainty that they did not previously have. And also the, the, unique, the unique structure of this co-ownership through an LLC has treated this true community organization that shares risk and reward across all those eight uh, equity partners. Furthermore, uh, all, while all of the CCOs are required to have a local governance structure, including a community advisory committee uh, that ensures that the health needs of the individual community are being met, the Eastern Oregon CCO has gone beyond that and created a local advisory committee in each of the 12 individual counties that they represent. And over the past uh, number of years, the CCO has pooled the cost savings that they've generated by operating actually below the 3.4% a growth rate. They've been operating at probably 2%. Uh, percent, uh, and they've taken those savings and reinvested them back into the communities based on the recommendations of the local advisory council so that they can address specific health needs in those communities. And that in turn has fostered this sense of meaningful community engagement and local ownership and local control. Uh, as of August of this year, they have reinvested $170 million into these small rural communities, which has made an enormous uh, difference. It's also important to note that 
that uh, the CCOs are working to address health issues across the region because this value-based global budget uh, within the uh, um, uh, 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 with the, with the fixed growth cap actually creates incentives to focus on prevention and the social determinants of health, uh, both of which require a different kind of community-based delivery model. So that reason in partnership with the Oregon State University uh, College of Public Health and Human Services, the CCO has started investing in a community health worker training program started in 2016. There are now over a hundred community health workers. that are working to keep people at home and out of the acute care hospital across those 12 counties. And they've just started a healthcare interpreter training program to improve communications with their Hispanic members. So in short, this small CCO in a huge geographic rural area is beginning to transform the face of healthcare. Now, in closing, I, I just want to say that I'm not suggesting in any way that, that CCOs are perfect. They're not. They are a work in progress, including the Eastern Oregon CCO. But they're beginning to honestly address some of the underlying flaws in the current healthcare delivery model. And in the process, they're building community. And that's something that I think we could use a lot more of uh, right now. If I could have the last slide, please. I just want to say that having lived in, in a rural timber dependent community for many, many years, um, rural America is an integral part of Oregon and it's an integral part of this country. And it is a huge asset and should be treated as one. Its powerful landscapes help define us. One out of five Americans lives in a rural community and depends on a rural hospital, a local hospital for their care. Yet last year alone, 20 rural hospitals closed in this nation. Over 130 have closed in the last 10 years. And to turn that around, we need both the wisdom and the courage to recognize that this is an issue that should concern all of us. It is not just a health issue. It is also an issue that threatens the fabric of our rural communities and in a very real sense, that threatens, threatens us as well. So I look forward to discussing for this further in the panel and I thank you very much for letting me to participate today in this, uh, this very important uh, summit. Thank you, Governor, uh, for your presentations. And I could certainly attest to the closure of many of our rural hospitals across America, but in particular here in Alabama, we've had 12 hospital closures over the last eight and a half years. And so it is de uh, devastating to our communities and to those communities and it also stifles the growth of those communities. And so uh, we certainly appreciate the work that you've done uh, and, and will continue to do uh, and hope that other states and, and, and other governors will follow suit. So thank you. Next we'll have, and I will turn it over to Sean Robbins. Sean is the executive director, executive vice president of external affairs for the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association a national federation of 35 independent community-based and locally operated Blue Cross and Blue Shield companies. Today, one in three Americans are covered by Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and Sean provides leadership for Blue Cross external affairs functions, including the Office of Policy and Representation in Washington, D.C., early in his career. He also played a key role in building Oregon's statewide economic development uh, strategy. And I would like to um, bring in, uh, present to some, and introduce to others, uh, Mr. Sean Robbins. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me and for that kind introduction. Uh, what you uh, may not have uh, known in that resume is that I'm following an old friend and my former boss, Governor John Kitzhaber, uh, who when I was living in Oregon for probably one of the most fun, informative decades of my life and career, I worked for him as, as the Secretary of Economic Development in the state. And candidly, there's nobody with more substance, more authenticity, more credibility on the topic of rural health care in this country, at least in terms of former governors, than John Kitzhopper. So it's an honor to go after him. Candidly, you could have done the mic drop with John. Um, he's that good. Um, so I'll spend just a few minutes um, uh, walking you through how we're viewing rural health care at Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, I think it's important to start with this concept that we're in every zip code in America, in every state. We cover one in three Americans. There's 111 million people in this country count on us. We're the only insurer to be in every zip code in every state. Uh, we take that not only as an opportunity for us, but a responsibility to the people we serve and to the nation at large. We've been with Americans since the 1940s, and we're with them today. And we're trying to think about what does the country need from us for the next 
hundred or so years as we go forward. And they're different needs than they were a hundred years ago. Uh, but I'm going to start with a quick story. Um, it actually relates to Governor Kitzhopper. When I worked for John back in Oregon in the mid-2010s, one of the most important and formative things I did was travel the state. And I traveled the state. We did 12 town hall tours across, across Oregon. And we were trying to do is figure out what does each community need from us? There was no one-size-fits-all solution coming out of Salem, Oregon. We had to respect the natural landscape, the businesses, the geography, the economies, the unique needs of the places that we served. After a long three-month tour and 12 stops, and any elected official knows what these feel like, you can be tired at the end of these after a long, hot summer, especially in Oregon. As a last stop, we're having cheeseburgers in downtown Baker City, Oregon. We got a group of thoughtful, influential folks sitting around a table at an old historic hotel in downtown. And I'm asking them, what do you need from my department, from my agency to move the needle on your economy here in Baker City? And we ran around the table, no silver bullet, no silver bullet, no silver bullet, next person, no silver bullet. Last person made the most probably important statement I still carry with me to this day. He said, Sean, I just need you to keep showing up just like this. We want to be seen. We want to be heard. We need to be understood. The decisions, the challenges, the opportunities that are on one side of the state aren't the same as they're over here in Eastern Oregon. And candidly, it's been too long since we've seen folks like you come over to our side of the state and have this kind of conversation. So thank you. Just keep showing up. I said, boy, I can keep showing up if we keep having hamburgers together, um, if that's all it's going to take. And Governor Kitzhopper probably had the most authentic commitment to that type of relationship with rural stakeholders across the state. And I carried that with me, and it informs candidly part of what I do today here at scale across the country at Blue Cross Blue Shield of America. Earlier this year, we launched a pretty ambitious, bold social commitment on health equity earlier in the year. And one of the first tactical, tangible things we're looking to move the needle on is maternal health outcomes. Sort of an abomination, particularly in communities of color, that mothers have higher mortality rates than their white counterparts. We got to fix that. It's a huge problem, and we're working to move the needle on it. But also, as part of health equity, it isn't just about race, it's not just about gender. Health equity also has to be about rural and urban health disparities. Our commitment is that everyone, no matter who you are, where you live, deserves access to good quality health care. And that should mean whether your color of your skin, your gender, where you live should not be a differential if we can help it. And I want to throw some statistics out. I'm not going to bore you with statistics. But there's three numbers I want to point out that maybe if you forget nothing else from my comments today, you take these away. Sort of defining the problem. When it comes to heart disease, cancer, uh, lower respiratory uh, conditions, Rural citizens have somewhere between a two and a half to seven times higher likelihood of dying from those diseases than their rural counterparts, than their urban counterparts, excuse me. So let me rephrase that. The leading causes of death, heart disease, cancer, uh, chronic lower respiratory diseases. If you live in rural America, you're anywhere from two and a half to seven times more likely to die from those diseases than folks who live in a city in terms of the preventive ability, right? So this isn't just a, a uh, challenge in concept. This is a challenge that's manifesting itself in health outcomes, right? Why is that? One of the reasons, and this is only one of them, is the rate of primary care representation in rural communities is significantly behind their urban counterparts. So on average, on 100,000 people, right, rural primary care physicians, there's 39 of them for every 100,000 people. In urban settings, it's 54 physicians. Now that delta may not sound like a lot, but proportionally, it's a 25% difference between urban and rural communities in having access to a primary care physician. And primary care physicians are who unlock so many of the ongoing uh, sort of chronic condition management 
early prevention work that the governor spoke to in his earlier comments, without that access, right, without that early diagnosis, without that prevention work that goes on in a primary care setting, in a family doctor where there's a trusted relationship, what happens? Well, you do start to see these health disparities begin to emerge, right? So that may not explain the whole problem, but it's something substantive and real that we need to get our hands around to understand what's driving that difference. You're going to hear from me in a second, right? Constructive solutions around rural health care. But I want to give some examples. And this is why I work for the Blues. I, candidly, I'm not sure I would work for any other health payer in this country, in part because we are embedded in every community across this nation and every zip code. So I'm going to give you three examples from three places where we do business. One of them uh, in Alabama. I'll get a, maybe a smile here from, from our uh, moderator and co-host. But Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama has spearheaded a program with the University of Alabama at Birmingham to establish telemedicine carts in rural hospitals, improving access to specialists so that distance and geography don't have to be the barrier where telemedicine can essentially expand their local network virtually using telehealth and telemedicine. And of course, during COVID-19, one of the things that we did wonderfully as a healthcare system, and I think it was an old elected official that once said, don't waste a good crisis. Well, we didn't waste a good crisis in healthcare. We actually relaxed a lot of the rules around telemedicine and telehealth, particularly a lot of the archaic, antiquated rules that got in the way of states being able to license and credential qualified physicians that could provide care in the same way that we're all talking here today. Now, that's not right for every condition, and it's not right in all cases. But if we're going to have any hope of expanding access to the supply of medicine to rural communities, but doing it in a way that doesn't actually add cost, because by the way, nobody wants to keep paying more for healthcare. Then we can't just keep building hospitals and building outpatient facilities in these communities. We have to be able to extend the current infrastructure we have, and telemedicine is one of the ways that we can do that without necessarily adding huge cost infrastructure to the healthcare system. And Alabama's done great work on that, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Now, Flip to the other side of the country, up where the governor still lives, up in Oregon. Now, if you go to the north a little bit across the boundary in, in the state of Washington, Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield is approaching in a different way by building a pipeline of nurse practitioners to embed them in rural communities through the Rural Nursing Health Initiative. Now, this is spearheaded with the University of Washington School of Nursing, investing over $5 million into the program and really to produce 20 students per year that come out of the system in the pipeline and get embedded in rural communities. So this is a combination of human beings, nurse practitioners, who in many cases can deliver equivalent uh, services to a physician at a lower cost structure. And this complements more of a telemedicine approach where we're able to expand the network of specialists in those places. So Primera up there has been focused on this uh, in, in, up in Washington out of the Seattle area and moving into Eastern and Central Washington. And the last example I'll give is Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Mexico for our Native American traditions and communities, right? Part of diversity, equity, and inclusion, a lot of the, uh, our, our work gets the focus is diversity and the equity piece. I often say to my teams, even internally, the I part matters too, inclusion. Inclusion in the conversation, inclusion in how we collect data, inclusion on how we make the system accessible to them, not making them bend themselves to us, right? So at Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Mexico, knowing that the Native American population represents an important part of their community, um, they make up 10% of the state's population, for example, but they carry 30% of all the state's COVID-19 cases, right? So even in terms of language accessibility and Navajo translators on customer service lines, these are ways the plans are figuring out how to break through and serving people where they are and how they come to us, not making them change how they come to us, but how we go to them. You know, I'm going to wrap here. Um, I want to give some, those are good examples. And we've sort of defined the problem or the challenge, at least at, at a high level in terms of primary care. Um, mortality rates from diseases between the urban and rural counterparts, and even some examples of what we can do 
as blues in our local community to try to make a difference in these areas. There's also, of course, macro policy solutions that we think need um, some consideration, both at the federal, but also at the state levels too. And you heard me talk earlier on telehealth about ensuring access to telehealth and telemedicine. I would sure hate to see us go back to a pre-COVID world where we're still living with what I like to call as the MS-DOS regulations of healthcare that may have worked in the 1970s and 80s when we put floppy disks in computers. But today, it turns out people don't even know. My kids who are 14 and 12 have no clue what a floppy disk is or that the fact that there was a five and a quarter inch version of it, right? Let us not go back to the days where those regulations remain on the books for telemedicine and telehealth. I've talked to too many, too many primary care physicians, candidly, um, who have come to telehealth and said, wow, I've never used this. I, I don't know why I was so reluctant to in the past. This has given me the ability to connect with my um, patients far more frequently and more easily than I'd ever been able to in the past. So together, payers, providers, we have to figure out with policymakers what we can do to make more of these um, easing of restrictions on telehealth and telemedicine permanent. We also have to provide some flexibility. Um, Part of what we learned as payers in the system Um, as part of this, is we have to find ways to be more flexible as well. And COVID-19 forced us to do that, and that produced some very good and positive outcomes. You're not going to hear me get up here and articulate a point of view just for payers. I'm interested in solving rural health care. And that means all of us have to come to the table with things we have to change and do differently. And some of that is flexibility. Now, we have to do all of this by protecting trust. of the patient-doctor relationship, but also of the information and the data. If we expand telehealth, if we broaden the rural broadband infrastructure to get more bandwidth capacity to rural communities to enable that, then the protection of that patient data is also just as important to making sure that those changes, those expansions of supply in the healthcare system for our rural communities are trusted by our rural residents, by our rural patients, so that they continue to get used. These are really, really important parts, and candidly, some of which are, particularly the rural broadband infrastructure, is included in um, some of Congress's considerations now going through um, the process in Washington, D.C. So again, I don't pretend to have a silver bullet. We don't pretend to have a silver bullet at Blue Cross Blue Shield. What we know is we have scale. And we have our roots embedded in every single community and every zip code in this country, unlike on any other payer. And we come to the table from the perspective, not of just advancing a payer perspective on this issue, but coming to the table trying to represent the people that we serve, knowing we're part of the system. And to be to change the system, to reform the system, to meet the needs of everybody, no matter where they are. And this includes rural residents as part of our conversation around health equity. Then we have to be willing to come to the table and talk about what they need, not what we need or what this particular stakeholder group needs from the old healthcare system. Because I think this is a great opportunity for us to continue to evolve and make a new one in the future. And I think John Kitzhaber and his work in Oregon gives us a nice template for that to build from going forward. So look, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here with, with all of you, um, particularly John. Um, I can't wait to get on a panel where we can see each other uh, real time. Uh, and I, I look forward to the panel discussion as well. Thank you very much for 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 listening a few minutes. Well, thank thank you, Sean, and thank you for all that Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, do all across the country. And to your point relative to uh, the telemedicine um, piece, uh, we're certainly proud to have that option here in the state of Alabama. Um, but also some of the other initiatives that I've seen across the country. Uh, as evidence from that Blue Cross and Blue Shield are are looking to solve the problem. So thank you for what you do and and what all of your uh, independent organizations do across the country to serve the citizens in those communities. So thank you. Now, um, I would like to reintroduce uh, Dr. Powers, who I mentioned earlier, uh, has a um, a lot of knowledge in, in healthcare. 
um, and and do a lot of work across the state of Alabama to serve the state government as well as working as an adjunct professor and a practitioner in the Birmingham area. And so now we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Powers to uh, the panel uh, and um, all of our panelists, uh, those individuals that you've heard from will be participating in our panel. And I'll um, kind of go back over the names. Uh, we have uh, Aiden O'Connor, uh, former Governor uh, Kit Saber, uh and Sean Robbins. Um, all welcome all of you. I'd like to welcome all of you to, to the panel discussion. And thank you for taking the time out of your schedules uh, to talk to our audience. And so uh, to our audience members, uh, please, if you're watching online, please submit your questions via the Q&A button. And so we certainly want to to ask your questions to our uh, very experienced and knowledgeable panelists that come from a, a number of industries within the healthcare infrastructure that's extremely important. And so I'll begin uh, with a question uh, to the panelists. Um, as experts in your field, I wanted to, to start by asking you, um, you know, what do you, what do each of you feel is the most important issue in rural healthcare today? And I'll begin with uh, Dr. Powers. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me, uh, and it's a pleasure to be on such a distinguished panel. Uh, just as a disclaimer, I am, I am on the faculty at UAB, and I'm also the, uh, uh, the uh, medical director for behavioral health for Viva, which is uh, one of our colleagues uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield in Alabama. That's the university affiliated, uh, University of Alabama Affiliated Health Insurance organization. And I am delighted, by the way, to say that we just achieved five stars from CMS on our rating. We're proud of that. Uh, and I also want to mention that because if you're in the insurance business, you know that care management is an important thing. And that's what defines the success of your operation. And I've, I've been able to participate in a fair amount of that since I've been with Viva. And I think it gives me some perspective on these things. Uh, I think that the, the, there are many issues that confront rural health care almost all of which were mentioned already. Manpower is one, uh, transportation is another. Uh, you know, we, we go, for instance, to great lengths to arrange to fall, for outpatient follow-up visits for our folks, especially persons with serious mental illness. But if they live in a rural area, getting them there uh, tends to be uh, sometimes quite a challenge. Uh, we also believe that, that the telemedicine uh, uh, issue is, is a good one. I actually practice telemedicine in uh, uh, when I was at the VA in, in both South Carolina and Georgia, when I was sitting in my office in Birmingham, and it is a very powerful and effective tool. Uh, however, it does have its limitations. For instance, you need to have a viable electronic medical record. Both the sending and the receiving facilities need to be tuned in properly. These are all technical issues that can be readily organized. And you have to have some consistency in the person who's actually doing the care rather than having a round robin of different people, which sometimes happens in, 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 in the rural areas. So these are, I would agree with pretty much everything that I've heard today with regards to solutions to the problems. However, I think the single most important uh, uh, obstacle that we're go we're gonna, we have confronted and we're going to continue to confront in rural health care is manpower. And uh, I am uh, uh, very concerned about the impact of COVID on the workforce uh, with regards to uh, burnout and, uh, and highly trained departures, not only from the rural, but from the, from the urban centers. Uh, without having adequate manpower, either in the field or uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the telemedicine site, uh, we're not going to be able to provide the care that we need to deliver. So I think that we really, we need to not only deal with the acute phase of what's going on with COVID, but it's pretty clear that uh, that uh, the physician workforce, at least 10% of them on a recent survey are talking, have thought about uh, uh, switching professions. Uh, and 60, 40, 40 to 60%, depends on whose statistics you look at, are experiencing burnout. So. That's the biggest alligator in the swamp right now with regards to, to trying to deal with problems that confront us. Longer term, though, everything that's been discussed so far, I think, is extremely important. 
Thank you, Dr. Powers. And we'll go over to uh, Governor Kitzhaber. Same same question. Dr. Powers, you're a hard act to follow. Um, I, I guess I would say that um, if I had to pick one issue, it would be the addressing the health disparities. And I, I pick that because I think it is an umbrella issue. It's, it's easy for us to look at pieces of the problem, but I think that's a unifying theme. In order to address the, the health disparities, you have to address a whole host of other issues. One of them is certainly the workforce uh, issue. And I think it's important to remember that although it's not readily apparent to a person who needs access to the acute care medical system, healthcare is a fairly medical care, the clinical care is a fairly minor contributor to overall health status. And I think the drivers of, of, uh, of the health disparities in rural Oregon are certainly lack of primary care and workforce issues and transportation, but they're also lack of community investment, their loss of uh, uh, economic opportunity, uh, all of which contribute, are, are major contributors to the social determinants of health and the, and, and the adverse community experiences. So I think we have to look at this more broadly. And, and um, Sean brought up this whole issue of being listened to. And if you'll allow me a very brief story, I, would, I think this is very telling. And it is a health issue, but it's also a, a larger issue. I'm a whitewater rafter. And one of my favorite rivers is the Rogue River in Southern Oregon. And I usually stop in Roseburg, my old hometown, very economically depressed for a long time to sort of provision my raft. Um, they're losing one to two people a day or worth the time, mostly young, uh, all unvaccinated. Protests uh, in the streets over the masks, just a lot of division in, in, in the community. It's just tragic to see this. And I got to thinking about it. And, um, you know, I lived with those people for 18 years. I, I drank beer with them, I fished with them, I sewed them up in the ER. They are really good people. They love their families and they love their communities. And they also feel like the world has left them behind and that the power centers are somewhere north in Portland and they don't care about them. And they're not, you know, they're not listening to them, as, as Sean said, how important that is. And instead of the state recruiting local trusted leaders, the head of the football team, the head of the Rotary Club, someone in the Farm Bureau, to be the messengers about why it's important to wear masks and get vaccinated for the community. Instead, they had someone from the outside telling them what to do when they're already beat down. And when you feel you don't have any choice in life except your personal choices, then you react in a different way. And I do think part of health, in, in creating health in rural communities is, is, is addressing these disparities, but doing it in a way that, that, that acknowledges them and honors them and recognizes the struggle that they have and listening to them. So I think that inclusion is just such a key part of, of solving this larger problem. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Aiden. Well, thank you, sir. I would I would echo the comments of the other panelists so far. Uh, if I was to put it under one umbrella, I would define it as transport medicine. Uh, you know, either responding to these patients in an emergency situation from the 911 system or moving them from hospital to hospital. Um, and I say that especially for our ground EMS partners who we work with day in and day out. Um, half of them are volunteers and, and they've been working their whole life, dedicated to the community, responding to calls. And many of them have aged out. Uh, they're unable to do it anymore. And there's no one to then fill that void that's happening in the volunteer system. And even from the paid system to similar to what Dr. Power said, we just don't have the, the number of individuals who are trained and ready to be deployed inside these ambulances, inside these helicopters. Um, so I, I'd almost say that in the next three to five years, you know, it's going to take that long just if we started today to invest in these individuals and, and try to recruit them in and deploy them. It's going to be a problem that we have for a while. And I, I used to transport medicine because just in the last couple of months with COVID, we see the workforce shortages in hospitals. We see an EMS and air medical has kind of helped fill that void to a certain extent. Um, but I would say long term, my biggest fear is do we have enough recruitment today to fill the, the people that we need? And then to also Dr. Power's point, the mental health portion of emergency medicine in general, seeing what they see on a daily basis. Um, that burnout uh, is certainly something that we're keeping a close eye on and, and trying to really infuse empathy uh, into that. But I would say transport medicine, moving patients from one place to another, or when they call 911, having somebody respond. Okay. Thank you. Sean. Well, I don't want to repeat what the governor and Dr. Powers said, but I, um, I'm going to because it's it's really important. There was such a strong connection between jobs and the economy and health. And part of what you know we learned in our experience in Oregon was when people have a job, when they have the dignity of work, which creates ability to invest in their families and their communities, 
it leads to improvements in transportation. It leads to improvements in food infrastructure. This is about prevention and overall health. A lot of the stuff we're talking about is episodic, it's acute, and it's after the die has been cast, right? So you have to have, what can we do today? And what do we need to do for the generation that lives in these communities in 10, 15, 20, and 25 years? And the answer is you can't have a better healthcare system if you don't have better health. The healthcare system is always going to try to be catch up to the underlying health of the people that it serves. So there has to be a dual track approach of looking at this more holistically about community social infrastructure, around jobs in the economy, around transportation, around access to foods, right? That's a long-term investment infrastructure that today's political cycle typically isn't patient enough to wait for. Um, but they're necessary antecedents and actually to being able to, to bend the long-term cost curve of care and improve the overall outcomes. And in the same time, we have, we have people today, we have a generation today that needs our help in probably more acute ways like primary care access, telemedicine, broadband infrastructure, transportation. But I would go broader. Those are all those are all good sort of ornaments on the tree. <laughs> but the tree, and I think that not to get lost in the governor's probably earlier comments, payment reform. Until we fundamentally change how we fund and finance healthcare in the country from a, a model that that essentially incents you to do more care, more tests, more transport, more visits, more drugs. We're never actually going to move away to a system um, that incents quality outcomes um, at a controlled price. And by control, I mean competition, choice, but finding ways to ensure we're paying for outcomes and value, not just volume of services being pumped out of today's healthcare system. So I would say one of the things we don't want to lose in this conversation is payment and payment reform. And I think federal government, particularly CMS and HHS, has an opportunity with its innovation center to be more expansive in rural healthcare payment models than we've been in the past. Now they've been working and trying and 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 kind of playing around with things for the last 10 years. But I would love to see CMMI go further. Sorry for the healthcare acronym. Um, CMMI go further and implement more rural-based, value-based outcome okay. programs to actually change how we finance and pay care. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and that leads into a question from one of our um, online viewers that talks mostly about preventative care and engaging dietitians and nutritionists in this process uh, to create a better diet so that then long term, it'll reduce the, the, you know, the, a lot of the diseases that you underlining health conditions that you mentioned. And so, so t talk a little bit about, and I would go uh, really go to use first, Sean, um, and, and really, I guess they're more talking about the reimbursement and engagement of um, being reimbursed, reimbursable for <clears throat> more on the preventative care side with and engaging dietitians and nutritionists. So tell me, talk a little bit about that and, uh, and how you see us really moving forward long term in a, in a better way in order to reduce some of the strain on our healthcare system. So after I worked for the governor down on the bottom of that screen, I was the president and CEO of Blue Shield of Idaho, another rural, mostly rural state, rural community. Most of our members were based in rural communities. And, and I'm going to get to your question because it, it, it's tied here. We and another major hospital system, physician and hospital system, knew that the future was going to have to be in this alternative payment model space. We also knew that the consolidation of the industry was going to force, in a good way, potential players to come together and reinvent how we essentially create shared P&L responsibility for a patient population. It doesn't have to just be the government and a Medicaid program that can do that. You can create private entity payer, private entity physician network and hospital coming together to create a essentially a joint venture shared risk arrangement on outcomes with a total cost dollar infrastructure to pay for that population. This is hard to do. It's not done every day. 
Um, you have integrated payers and providers today, the Kaisers of the world out West, um, the Inner Mountain Select Health out West. But that doesn't give consumers the degree of choice that they always want either because it artificially narrows their networks. So imagine a day where you could have a large national scaled plan and an infrastructure of physicians and hospitals working together under a joint venture model to essentially create and shift the risk um, onto a shared arrangement for the outcomes and the cost of that population. In that system, diet, nutritionists, those would be folks called into a doctor-patient relationship as necessary to affect an outcome because it's in the system's incentive to deliver that outcome at a particular cost. Mm -hmm. In today's system, it's refer to this person, to that specialist, to this group who charges and asks for reimbursement it sort of grabs their piece of the financial healthcare pipeline of money. But if we created a model where we put the dollars in a pool together in the private sector, we'd have an opportunity to get a nutritionist, a dietitian in the right place at the right time for the right patient, for the right outcome, because everybody's incented for the outcome to drive the care, not the reimbursement from a fee-for-service system that we have today. All right. Thank you, Sean. Um, I'll go to Dr. Powers. Same question. Um, could you repeat the question, please? It was relative to the uh, engaging nutritionists and dietitians and focusing more on the preventative side. A lot of the diseases that was mentioned earlier, whether it's heart disease or diabetes or what have you, other underlying conditions. Many of those particular conditions, um, individuals believe have a, there's a direct correlation between diet and exercise. <clears throat> and so a lot of times our nutritionists and dietitians are not, uh, those areas are not reimbursed uh, or reimbursable among providers. By, yeah, not you, by, by insurance companies, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, state it, as well. It's, it's absolutely clear that issues like uh, obesity, exercise in the rural areas is a determinant of, of health. And, uh, and you want to do, and food security then goes along with that determinant. And, you know, whether or not you're at forced to eat calorie dense food all the time because you just don't have enough money uh, to buy other nutritious and transportation to go get the food. So, yeah, I would agree that, that having access to those kinds of uh, benefits that that uh, support good health. And, you know, whenever you send a care management team into the field, one of the things they always talk to the patients about is, you know, how is your diet? What are you eating? Uh, medication compliance and those sorts of things. Um, just to slightly switch the subject, though, a little bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and how you fund it, by the way, how you fund it is, is exactly what uh, 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 Sean was, was talking about and, and, and making sure that it's wrapped into the complete package. Uh, but, you know, getting people to believe what you're telling them can be a major obstacle as well. And I'm so delighted that you've got uh, Lieutenant Governor Steele on uh, for, for the further segment, because one of the things that we have to deal with is the infodemic that is uh, afflicting our patient populations. And, and I got to tell you, if I can't get a patient to take a COVID vaccination or a flu vaccination uh, with all of the direct information they're seeing, then trying to convince them to engage in a, you know, a year long or two year long dietary, uh, a dietary intervention or exercise intervention is also going to be quite a challenge. So the way we deliver information and education to our patients I think is going to be equally important from the operational standpoint. Okay. So the next, another question that I'll start with um, uh, Governor on, it addresses uh, access to uh, an OBGYN in rural communities. Um, we have um, pregnant women that have to drive distances as, as far as two to four hours uh, to see a doctor. Uh, many of the hospitals that have closed or reduced a lot of 
uh, of their operations, are there's still no OBGYNs or anyone uh, the, to care uh, for the mother uh, um, during during the time of pregnancy. And so they reference a model in uh, Minnesota uh, that kind of dealt with the prenatal care for women uh, in, in North Woods of Minnesota. And so if you can address, kind of talk a little bit about, uh, you know, access to um, health care for uh, pregnant women. Uh, one of the problems I would say I would reference is in the state of Alabama, pregnant women do qualify for Medicaid during the time of pregnancy. However, six, not even six months after, those services are eliminated. And so there is no care, postpartum care for uh, that mother um, where they are, they're not insured a year after. And sometimes these you know, there are, el there are ailments as a result of the pregnancy that that pregnant mother needs uh, following that. And so just kind of talk a little bit about uh, maternal uh, health and, and, and access to health care um, for mother pregnant women. So <clears throat> it's a great question. And I think we need to I, I think the, the, the operational term there is maternal health and child health, not necessarily maternal health care and child health care. So we know that toxic stress during pregnancy, whether that's from a substance or just, you know, housing insecurity or despair, uh, actually alters genetic expression uh, and alters the way these children process information and experiences later on and can e increase their risk of, of uh, you know, learning disabilities and a whole host of other risk factors. So I think this is a, a technology issue, it is a provider issue, and it is a community health issue. So starting off with providers, we don't have enough primary care providers in rural Oregon, certainly not enough OBGYN. I think in the short term, I think it's very, very important to uh, try to um, uh, improve reimbursement and opportunities for uh, um, nurse midwives, and nurse practitioners uh, to move into those areas to help provide some of that shortfall. I think that's uh, something that uh, the uh, OBGYN Professional society should actually support, particularly in rural Oregon, uh, rural America. It's not like there's competition, <laughs> a shortness of of, uh, of, uh, of people who are going to need those services. So that's one. And I think telemedicine can be, as, as Sean mentioned, can be very useful in terms of um, providing certain segments, not obviously the delivery itself, but certain certain segments of that. Certainly, some of the information that Dr. Powers was uh, was ta was talking about. Um, and changing the reimbursement, uh, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, the a lot of the, most of the things you know that affect a, a woman's pregnancies uh, have to do with community factors. They have to do with stable families. They have to do with uh, good nutrition, safe housing, safe communities. They have to do with feeling that they don't have uh, an economic burden on, on on themselves. So it gets back to those larger issues that we have to address if we want a healthy country rather than just a country with access to health care. Uh, and um, the reimbursement system should reflect that. Uh, I, I didn't comment on that first question, but the question before this that you were talking about, the incentives are all backwards. Uh, if you are in a, in a, if you are in a global budget, a capitated global budget that's linked to quality and outcomes, you have a vested interest, an economic interest in making sure you reduce the disease burden and that you pay for prevention. And right now, you know, the medical loss ratio is based on spending a certain portion of your budget on medical care, where you should be rewarded for spending more of that budget on, on in, the, in, the, in, the, in the community, right? So it's a complicated issue, but I think it's one that's manageable and challenged and, 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 and we can address, but we have to be a little more open, a little more holistic about what we're really trying to accomplish. We want a healthy pr a woman, but we also want a healthy postpartum woman and a really healthy child who is gonna be ready to learn when they get to school and will be a productive uh, and healthy member of that community. So let's broaden the scope a little bit, tick off the four or five things we have to do and get to it. Thank you, Governor. Aiden, same question. Yeah, no, this is very pertinent at the moment. I'm working with uh, two very rural local hospitals. One lost their only OBGYN uh, position, so they had to no longer accept cases. And the other one uh, did a cut during the financial stress in the last year. Um, so, you know, I'll echo the, the workforce development uh, portion of it. I'll, I'll certainly uh, echo the reimbursement side of it. But I'll say that that's something that we then make a customized, you know, plan to say if an individual comes in and gives birth, 
there's no physician available, you know, how do we transport that patient? So we work very closely with ground EMS and, and air ambulances to make sure that we have a, a mode for the reactive state to move that patient to where they need to go. And I'll just say my meeting this morning before coming here was around the, the NICU. And I'll only say that, you know, as the age, you know, gets the baby boomers and age populations change, specialized medicine is becoming more and more expensive. You know, we were looking at a NICU isolate to move some of these infants and, you know, the cost of them is anywhere between $225,000, $250,000. Um, so I'd only say that from a reimbursement standpoint too, it's not all the same. Uh, moving one patient by ground ambulance on a stretcher with the mother versus going by a NICU isolate, you know, that reimbursement has to somehow uh, add up to that to make sure that we have those investments, especially in these rural communities. Okay. Thank you. Sean? I love the way the governor talked about health versus health care, right? And this is back to this idea that we can't change the trajectory of health care and cost and quality if we don't actually invest in the underlying health of the people that we serve. And this is actually, you know, I, I think this is a decent place to point out a number, a, a data point that startled me. In the year 2021, in one of the most affluent nations on the face of the earth, a black woman in this country is three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than a white woman. I don't care where you live, <laughs> urban, rural, that should offend everybody on this call and in the healthcare system. We have got to do better than that. And that isn't a rural problem. It's not an urban problem. It's not a, just a black problem. It's not a Latino problem. By the way, there are complications in the Latino community have increased by 20% during COVID on pregnancy for women. And it's not just a gender issue. It's a father issue. It's a societal issue. All of us have a vested interest in taking care of our children and their mothers. And so I, I want to underscore the point that the governor made that this is this is about um, again. It's kind of like this Christmas tree. We have lots of ornaments of things we can hang on the tree of things we think we can do to get after it, but we have to decide as a healthcare system that these types of data points are unacceptable to us, and that we have to commit together to reduce that disparity. We we are trying to push really hard on this one to say that in five years we need to reduce maternal health disparities among Black and Latino women by 50%. That ha and it's not going to be Blue Cross Blue Shield alone. One, one payer in this network can't do this alone. But we feel a need to raise the flag on it and say out loud, physicians, whether you're independent or hospital-owned, hospital systems, whether you're independent or you're an integrated system with a, with a payer, all of us, all of us across the healthcare spectrum have to get after this one. Thank you, Sean. And we're beginning to see this, especially in rural communities across, even here in our state. Um, you know, the, the health care is extremely important, especially maternal health. Uh, in fact, we've decided to start investing in a study group to start studying uh, and researching uh, in the areas for, for maternal health with an emphasis on women of color. And so that's something that we're, we're looking at and certainly uh, should look at this more on, on a national perspective and, and certainly welcome uh, any of you guys to kind of continue to work with us on that so that we can solve the problem beyond where we are, but across the country. And so thank you, uh, Sean, for your, your comments uh, on that. Uh, one particular issue that I'd like to throw in um, that's healthcare related that is not necessarily talked about, it's talked about in, in, in a lot in different states, um, is mental health and mental health services. <clears throat> and so um, I'll start with Dr. Powers on this um, and on mental health. Uh, what do you think, what are we doing, what are we not doing in addressing uh, mental health services in this country, uh, but also point to some examples of uh, where we're lagging behind, uh, particularly on, um, given your experience uh, in, in the state of Alabama? Well. You know, I, I think if you really want to know what's going on in mental health, you ought to go talk to your local sheriff, because the sheriffs are the ones that are dealing in law enforcement, are dealing with uh, the shortages in mental health services at the granular level. 
and uh, they, you've seen a significant uh, 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 reduction in the quote institutional care for uh, persons with mental illness across the country. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that we saw the expansion of community-based services at the level and with the specificity that uh, was necessary to compensate for the closure of those uh, of those facilities. And sadly, in many of these individuals wind up all tangled up with the with the uh, criminal justice system and in the refer in the rural areas, the only other place that can handle them if they've gotten themselves into trouble is that they wind up with the sheriffs and the sheriffs, by the way, absolutely hate having these folks in their in their uh, in their uh, 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 jails simply because they, they need help. They don't need to be with them. Uh, so, you know, I, I, and, and I think that might be an, an interesting point to have a conversation with as we move forward. Uh, that I think that uh, lot, many sheriffs are big proponents of, uh, of mental health. The rates of mental health in the rural areas, there are some subtle differences. And one of the problems that you run into with research on rural uh, health issues is, first of all, for instance, what is rural? Uh, if there's a publication out recently that said that there are eight different federal definitions of what rural is. Uh, so then, you know, are you comparing apples to oranges? So I don't want to get into the specifics of numbers, but in general, uh, persons who reside in rural areas uh, suffer probably slightly higher, but reasonably similar rates of mental illness in, in, in some regards, like things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. What's missing is the treatment uh, system. Uh, and if you look at the numbers of counties in, in the United States that have rural counties that have no psychiatrist at all, it's really quite substantial. So the, the problem isn't so much that living in a rural area makes you mentally ill, so much as it is if you have a mental illness, then finding the appropriate services in that community uh, can be problematic. For instance, in Alabama, we've been either 48th or 50th in the per capita mental health providers. Uh, thank God for Mississippi, because they've usually kept us out of that 50th slot uh, for, for a long time. And, and so finding mental health providers who will go into the rural communities, especially psychiatrists, psychiatric nurse practitioners, is a problem. And, and if you look at the use of telemedicine, the majority of tele, the, up until COVID, the majority of telemedicine interventions were being done for behavioral health reasons. And by the way, it works pretty well. So I think everything you can do to expand telehealth and make sure that it's a really valuable service, that it does all the things that I talked about before, can really help with that. However, getting providers into the uh, communities is going to be a, a problem especially in the specialty areas such as geriatric psychiatry. I've been primarily a geriatric uh, and psychiatrist and a neuropsychiatrist. That's a given, especially given the fact that there's accelerated aging population in, in, in the rural populations, uh, that's going to, going to be a real challenge. But I think that the, what we face right now was, what we faced over the last decade was uh, reduction in public resources without a compensatory expansion of community-based resources. And that then created immense difficulties, especially for the rural providers. Uh, in Alabama, for instance, we closed almost all of the state hospitals. And I must say that I don't, it was, in my opinion, it was done for financial reasons, that they had a budgetary shortfall and, and they just started closing facilities. Uh, and I don't believe, for instance, in Alabama that we ever had adequate community-based resources. In addition to that, I want to go back to COVID because, again, I think it's the biggest alligator in the swamp right now. It's been very, COVID has been very disruptive to mental health services. Uh, for instance, group homes that would typically take a person to, who's diverted out of an emergency room slowed down their admission rate because of concerns about COVID. Uh, Support groups for persons with a mental illness stopped meeting. And while some of them tried to carry on using uh, Zoom type uh, meetings, it's not the same thing. It's been very disruptive for our partial hospital programs and our intensive outpatient programs. So COVID has, has also impacted directly beyond what you might see for other types of medical care. 
uh, for for our rural citizens. And so I think that they're while they were struggling before, I think they're struggling even more now. So, Governor, I think uh, this is an issue just, just relative to, to your state and your experience. Talk a little bit about the struggles with and, and addressing uh, mental health services. Well, uh, the, the, the most important data point is we've got to get ahead of it. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But I think Dr. Powers is right. I think the last uh, bill that President Kennedy signed was the bill that deinstitutionalized uh, folks with mental illness, they were being warehoused. It was a good thing, but the money never followed into the community. So you've got this huge group of untreated people who are, who are, who are struggling. So that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is a payment problem. You know, we pay less for mental health, behavioral health services than physical health services. We pay less for addiction services than we do for behavioral health services, right? So there's that. And then there's a stigma. And we need to, we need to recognize that there's a stigma associated with this, that we need to begin talking about this, I think, in a, in a, in a, in a different way. Um, you know, I do think that that uh, the, the pandemic is the big alligator in the swamp. And when it comes to mental health and, and substance use disorder, it was an accelerator. It took a problem that was already there that we failed to address, and it made it much more visible and much more acute. And it just strikes me and troubles me that we can produce a vaccination against COVID-19 in a very short period of time, and we can't figure out how to prevent and manage what is truly a national crisis. I mean, the cost of behavioral health and substance abuse disorder to this country in terms of lost human potential and just economically is absolutely staggering. And I think the first five years of our CCOs, which operate on this capitated budget, was really a journey of discovery. I think they realized for the first time how a huge uh, uh, behavioral health and substance use issues are in terms of most other physical conditions, that they are related, that they drive them, there's comorbidities involved. The single most expensive diagnosis for a CCO is opioid addiction right now. So they're pretty highly motivated. And I think what they recognize, and, and I'm not saying we've got the answer here, but I would say we've got the right questions, is that you, you, can, you, you need the treatment capacity. We've got a whole generation of school kids and probably some school teachers who are really struggling emotionally because of what they've gone through that, that desperately need our care, as Sean says, right now. But at the same time, if we don't deal with the underlying socioeconomic issues <clears throat> that lead to addiction <clears throat> and behavioral health disorders, we're never going to get ahead of this one. And if you haven't read them, there's two books that I think really capture this. One is by uh, Angus Duncan, uh, Deacon, and um, um, uh, it's called Deaths of Despair, which really talks about what's happened to middle class America, much about rural America. And the other one is called Tightrope. America's Struggling for Hope by New York Times columnist uh, um, um, Nicholas Kristof. But I do think that the root causes are very similar <clears throat> to the root causes of a lot of the health disparities we see across our country, the educational disparities. And sooner or later, we have to recognize that, <clears throat> you know, that, that we need to be focused as a country on the World Health Organization definition of health, which is total physical, social, and emotional well-being, not just you know, disease and disability. And, um, you know, if, if we could write a prescription for America right now, that'd be it. And if we could fill that prescription by spending more money on the medical care system, we would have been there a long time ago. But we've got 50 years of data that shows us that universal health care for all Americans isn't the same as a healthy America. And so I think behavioral health and substance use disorder, which is right in the front now because it's driving costs in our schools, it's driving costs in our public safety system, in our local jails, is right there in front of us. And it's, it's telling us that we have to go upstream that we have to go upstream and we have to do it now and we have to do it effectively. And that will have a huge impact, I think, on, on rural America, but it'll have a great beneficial effect as well on, on the rest of the country. Thank you, Governor. I'm gonna pivot to um, a, a survey conducted um, by the One Country Project recently, where we asked our uh, uh, respondents, um, what is the most pressing issue um, relative to healthcare uh, as you see it today, what's the most important issue? And many of them re respondents um, re responded by saying that we should be addressing the rising cost of insurance premium. So I'll go to you, Sean. How do we address this, this issue? It, premiums are a reflection of the cost of the healthcare system that's underneath it. It's that simple. So if you don't like your premium, what you're really saying is you don't like the cost of health care that underlies the whole thing. So premiums are just a reflection of the cost of that care. So 
back to the earlier comments I made, you know, if you think about this as a total healthcare challenge, not a payer or provider, pharma company or biomedical device, but you look at it as healthcare at the highest level for this country, until we change how we compensate for outcome, moving from a, hey, the more volume you do, the more you get paid, <clears throat> to a, the better outcome you produce at a fixed cost system, we will always have an escalating and inflating healthcare system that leads to escalating healthcare premiums. It's, it's really that simple, and yet it's complex underneath it. Um, but one of the challenges we have as a country is we've built a system that confuses the American public between their health insurance premium and health care. The cost of the system is too costly. It's just too much. And every time you ask people for their solutions, what they basically tell you is we need more money. And when you ask consumers what they need, they say, I got to spend less. Well, the answers to the solutions can't be, I need more, I need more, I need more. And the only real practical way that I've been able to think of to solve it, and not because it was my idea, but because we're standing on the shoulders of other people who've gone before us, is to change for value and outcomes at a fixed cost for managing that population. That's why elements of the CCO model that the governor talked about in Eastern Oregon are really important. It's not the only model, and it's not perfect. But it's an attempt at rewarding outcomes, not just reimbursing each little provider for their piece of the total health care pie. And until we get the system to that place, we're going to keep having these questions around why do my health insurance premiums go up? They go up because the cost of care is going up. All right. I think the solution is there. It's just really hard to get us there. and We needed to get there yesterday. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Aiden, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, no, I definitely will. You know, certainly coming from being a flight paramedic, I'm grateful for working for Air Methods uh, a few years ago. We'd run into a situation where we'd go pick up patients uh, who devastatingly needed to get to another hospital for uh, definitive care. And they would see the helicopter and they would hear all this bad publicity, all this bad press about the cost of Air Medical. And they would even be so nervous that they would contemplate whether or not getting in the helicopter or potentially dying in the hospital just because of the, the cost, the perceived cost of it. And, and I'd say that we've implemented what's called the patient advocacy program a few years ago. And, and because of that and going in network with insurance companies, our out-of-pocket expense nationwide for patients who are flown or in their families about $200 on average nationwide. And you know, a lot of physicians will now tell us that's less than if we try to Uber the patient to the definitive care in these rural environments to where they need to go. But I will tag on to what Sean just referenced. You know, there's a pool of healthcare dollars, right? We're all responsible for how much are we costing the system. And I will say, you know, there's there's press out there that talks about the cost of it, but we're 0.1% of the total healthcare transport uh, medicine cost of the healthcare dollars. And, you know, we look at that because specialized medicine requires more money, but how can we do it where it's more efficient? And how can we do it where we could stretch it, especially for these rural environments? And that's something that we work on every day. Thank you. And so in talking about the big elephant in the room, I want to go pivot and go over to COVID-19 uh, and, and, and the um, things that we know, the things that we don't know, and, and, and the pushback on vaccinations. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, Governor, I know that uh, governing is important. It's easy to run a campaign, but when you start to govern, uh, you have to make some real decisions. And so what do you see? What are we missing? on managing uh, this pandemic and how do we, I know you mentioned earlier that, you know, going to the Rotary Club and others being messengers uh, to advocate for individuals to get vaccinated, trusted local people, um, but also our military personnel who have had shots for a number, a number of different shots uh, to, to go off and that it was a requirement. And so what do you think we're doing wrong and what do you think we can do? Where, where could we do better in managing this crisis? And if you were managing the crisis, tell us a little bit about what you would do different. Well, I, I want to say, first of all, that, that um, I think, uh, uh, fortunately, I never had to manage through, I got to manage through 9-11 and, uh, and uh, forest fires and floods, but never a pandemic. And I think for a governor, 
uh, managing through a pandemic or a public health crisis is a series of lose-lose decisions. And I just want to make that clear. I think our governor's done a, a good job in, 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 in making those decisions. I would have supported uh, mass mandates, uh, and I certainly would support uh, mandatory vaccinations, particularly for people who are providing health care. It just makes no sense to me from a public health standpoint to have someone who is has an active disease or could be spreading the disease in a hospital setting filled with people who went there because they thought it was a safe place. You know, I think I think the, the COVID situation is very troubling to me. And I, I think that part of it is somehow we managed to politicize public health in this country. And, and I, you know, that that uh, that genie's out of the bottle and it's going to take a lot of, you know, a lot of work to get it back. I think this one's going to be with us for a while. I think it's also exposed a lot of uh, uh, problems with our underlying healthcare system. The fact that we've hollowed out our entire public health infrastructure in this country uh, for years, for decades. Um, we have recognized that um, uh, a lot of the revenue the hospital makes is elective procedures. Uh, right. And, and you need to ask about hospital capacity in those cases. You need to talk about whether or not going forward, we need some flex beds that can be repurposed quickly if you need to expand because of COVID-19. Uh, we need to look at the whole issue of how you get people out of the hospital and back into the community, which is also a workforce issue. In Oregon in August, we had something like 395 people in the hospital who had gone in for COVID. They could be discharged and we couldn't get them out because there wasn't enough um, a workforce in assisted living facilities and long-term care facilities. So I think, I don't think, I think it's going to take years to deal with this, this, um, I think uh, Dr. Powers called it uh, the inf infodemic, <laughs> you know, that, you know, where do you go for a source of unbiased information? That one's going to be difficult and it's really, really important. Uh, but I think we, that what we can do is sort of look forward and learn what we can from the pandemic. Uh, one of them is that you've got to engage people and have conversations with people when you're asking them to do things like take a vaccine. I think that has to be a much higher priority, that communication network. But also we need to look at the healthcare system and figure out uh, the changes that we mean, need to make uh, as a result of, of, uh, of, that, of that pandemic. And uh, you know, I think we can do that. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned that this will continue to be somehow a political issue. You know, and as I said earlier, you know, the situation in Douglas County and Roseburg is really dire. I mean, I have friends who've died, young people who weren't vaccinated, uh, uh, children of people or uh, people that I've known for years. And uh, the, 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 this isn't a partisan issue. This is a human issue. And we need to, we need to kind of remind ourselves that um, uh, managing this pandemic going forward involves re-embracing one another as human beings uh, who share that common mortality. and. Uh, that has to be a central part of the conversation, I think, besides the technical aspects. Thank you, Governor. Aiden, um, being a young person, someone that's out there, uh, what type of what, what type of feedback are you getting uh, in, in, in among your friends and individuals that you come in contact with, uh, with the resistance for of, of, of getting vaccinated um, <clears throat> or any of the, the misinformation that's out there that uh, continue to spread. And so what, what, what are you saying and how are you responding to it? No, thank you. And uh, I, I will say, you know, similar to my introduction, I still live in a rural community, uh, more conservative leaning. Um, so it's amazing to me that I've shared my story on social media. I've shared my story with my friends, my family, even community wide about my time down in New York City during the surge. Uh, when I was asked to go down there with my colleagues to help triage and move these patients, whether by ambulance or by air, I never thought I would see what I saw. So the biggest thing that I am doing and, and have been doing and will continue to do is kind of share those real life experiences. My only regret is that we couldn't video what we saw because of HIPAA violations and whatnot. But I wish I could show people um, the devastation that caused on the healthcare system. Uh, the, the amount of individuals who I saw pass away in front of me over one night shift to see the, the anxiety and the stress that it put on the healthcare workers that night and the nights thereafter with crying and, and just pure anxiety and going outside just because they need a deep breath. Um, so I try to share those stories and my colleagues do the same. But what's amazing to me is even family members who I have told that story to, who, you know, I, I've, I've really opened up with tearful conversations. <laughs> they, they will take that at the moment. And then days later, they'll send me articles that, that kind of push back on that and say that there was no crisis, there was no COVID impact. And despite me telling them helping moving, you know, bodies out to temporary morgues, um, they push back on it. So all I could say is, you know, to continue to tell those stories in hopes that that day will never happen again, because what we saw that night and the nights thereafter 
uh, if that happened in our rural communities, it would not be sustainable with humanity and the infrastructure that we have as society. Dr. Powers, as a practitioner uh, and someone that's in on the ground day to day uh, at UAB and also in the community uh, that has a pretty Jeff Jefferson County has a pretty non a pretty high non vaccinated uh, population, uh, as do the state of Alabama. Uh, what are some of the the messages that you guys are receiving on the ground uh, relative to it, and what are your your colleagues in, in healthcare? Uh, what are they saying about this? Is it burning them out? Are you seeing a, a uptick in, in, in uh, resignations? Um, do you see students changing careers? Uh, tell me a little bit about what you see and what you forecast on the ground there. Well, I've been at UAB since 88. And again, I'm not speaking for UAB, Viva, or anybody else. I'm just talking for myself. Uh, I've never. We had a work action by the nursing service. Uh, and I've never, in, uh, since 1988, I've never seen anything close to that. And it was really about frustration and exhaustion. What I'm seeing is frustration and exhaustion. I have a, I have a son, I don't think he'd mind disclosing because he disclosed it in medical school, who was, uh, who was treated for uh, metastatic cancer uh, while he was in medical school. And it's fine now, but he's a cardiologist and does ICU care. Uh, and he was going in and still taking care of those patients in the ICU while they were telling him he was lying to them about their diagnosis and cursing him. And he continued with his empathic care for those individuals. I have several children who are, who are physicians, actually. And so that's just really kind of wearing and demoralizing uh, for the workforce. And we're seeing this in all the numbers. If you look at the mental health numbers, for the American workforce, it's really substantial with regards to insomnia, symptoms of depression, symptoms of PTSD, anxiety disorders. I was talking to two nurse executives yesterday, and they said, you know, Rich, what's going to happen is that our workforce is going to soldier on through these difficult times because you never give up your buddy in combat. But then when the battle is over, you're going to see people heading for the doors. And that's one of the concerns that I have, unless we're having this conversation uh, at, at, a, at a public level. Uh, now, what, what about people who are, I'm flabbergasted by people's uh, adherence to these false beliefs about the vaccination. What I try to explain to people is you have to deal with it like you, in what psychiatry we call an overvalued idea. An overvalued idea is not a delusion. It's just a belief that really... You know, it's the fellow at work that believes that, you know, the whole factory revolves around what he does and he's the most important person there. And if you try to talk him out of it, he, you can't and, and he'll argue with you. So the, I, what we don't want to do with people who are uh, vaccine resistant, and there are going to be 10 percent of the population who simply are not going to take the vaccine no matter what. But for the other 30 percent who are potentially uh, convincible, uh, you don't want to confront their belief system, but rather you just want to say, listen, I understand and, and, and talk in an empathic way and continue to persuade and do all the things that the governor was talking about with regards to finding, you know, uh, persons in the community who can speak on your behalf. And, and eventually we will win some of these people over to be vaccinated. But it, it, it is the, the other part of this that I'll just throw out there. This is the first time in my, I'm a scientist. I've got a bunch of publications and I'm proud of being a scientist. This is the first time in my memory where scientists are being openly challenged with regards to whether or not objective empirical truth is truth or whether my opinion is as good uh, as your, your science. And that's, that's going to have, that's going to have an impact. And, and, you know, we're, 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 we're going to have to be able to convince people that there is objective empirical uh, truth in all of this. Uh, so it's, it's really, and, and by the way, one of the resources that we're not talking about here that we ought to think about, partially because I'm on the national board for them, is the chaplains. So for instance, if you want somebody to speak with a knowledge of science, but also a, their feet grounded in faith, Chaplains are perhaps going to be an un underutilized tool that perhaps can speak to some of these people with regards to, no, there's no contradiction between your faith and the science that this doctor is trying to talk to you about. 
but but in summary, what I would say is I I have grave concerns about fatigue and burnout. I think we need to take the steps to avoid that. One other thing, I don't mean to talk on, but when you fill as an example, when you fill out your medical license renewal, they ask you whether or not you've been treated for a mental illness in Alabama. Uh, the boards could simply say, if you were treated for a COVID-related resilience issue, which which what this is, don't check this box. We don't want to know because we don't want to create disincentives to our healthcare providers to check the box and get the help. Or by checking the box, we want them to get the help. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to sort of take a different approach than what we've been taking so far, because quite frankly, I don't think it's working. Thank you. Sean, I give you an opportunity to address this. And guys, we'll have one uh, final question uh, and uh, about 30 second wrap up from each of you uh, following this question. So Sean, we'll give you an opportunity to address the same question. I'll be quick. Um, I think the the impact of the healthcare system has been well discussed from from folks here. I would just add to it the layer of additional kind of awareness <clears throat> around the folks who aren't in the healthcare system who are also <clears throat> carrying the COVID on their backs. The daycare and childcare systems, um, the single moms and dads who are trying to balance work from home and kids at home with no school, partial school, hybrid school, no daycare. Um, these folks, the country is carrying an enormous emotional burden on its back. And it's not surprising that it manifests itself the last year or so in some incredibly unproductive, unhealthy ways. Whether it's the school board member in Brevard County last night who was regaling how she's being followed by folks for doing her job, whether it's to Dr. Power's story of folks receiving care, sort of losing it, candidly. <laughs> uh, these are not uncommon. They're scarily not uncommon anymore. So I don't think that this is just a healthcare burnout issue. This is an American population burnout issue. A lot of people are carrying this. We're in a very fragile, I think we're in a fragile time period in this country, as, as the governor referenced earlier. And, and I don't think the infodemic, and I'm going to use that because that was very clever, and it is right on the money, um, is helping it. But I don't want to blame it on that. I, I think the country is undergoing a, a significant amount of, of sort of institutional trauma <laughs> over the last couple of years, politically, um, social life, health. These things are starting to add up. Thank you, Sean. One final question I'll ask uh, the governor or if Dr. Powers want to take a shot at it. There's a question from our viewers about uh, the enrollment in medical schools. Uh, how do we increase the, the enrollment in medical schools? Well, um, <clears throat> that's probably a longer question than 30 seconds. Uh, you know, I do think that um, I, I teach sort of pro bono a, a freshman medical students, at least I, I visit with them and talk to them about health policy on a regular basis. And, you know, I, you, you'd be amazed how many of them are very concerned about the payment methodology, and, and, right? And, and the fact that if you, if you have this huge debt burden, uh, the only way to pay it off is to go into a subspecialty that pays a lot of money when actually the real need is in primary care. And I, and I think there's a real awareness of that in, in medical school. So I guess the short answer is we make the healthcare system more attractive. We make it a health system rather than a system where you get your money fixing broken people, which is really what you're going to discover once you get out of medical school, all dewy-eyed and idealistic. You're going to figure out that your money comes from fixing broken people and that, that we begin to talk in medical school and in the profession about uh, healing uh, broken communities. And that by healing the broken communities, you have fewer broken people. So I think that would be the way I would approach it. And all, I just also have to say that Sean's answer, uh, just his last answer, we had to type that up and put that out and post that somewhere. That was, I think, an incredibly uh, compassionate and accurate and sensitive um, description of really what's going on in our nation today. Thank you, Governor. Dr. Powers. Yeah, I was I was distressed when one of my nurse executive colleagues said that their enrollment rates in nursing schools is down significantly in the last year. 
Uh, so uh, it's not just the physicians, but it's all the other healthcare professionals that we so desperately need. Every every doctor and nurse is a precious resource to each of our states. I, you know, I, I think we need to keep maintain a very positive message. I think we want kids uh, 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 enrolling in medical school for the right reasons. We just need to weather this storm and and you know and maintain that very positive attitude towards you know medicine as both a healing art as well as a science. Thank you. And thank you, gentlemen, for uh, this wonderful uh, panel uh, and the discussion around healthcare and, and the future of our country, especially with an emphasis on rural communities. Um, so I wanna thank you again for participating. Thank you for your willingness to participate in, in serving yours and being able to serve uh, knowledge to all of the viewers that are out there that are viewing online and engage us like you have. So I really certainly appreciate you. And at this time, I'll turn it back over to our host for today, uh, former U.S. Senator Joe Donnelly. Joe. Thank you so much. And what a great, great panel. And I want to, uh, to tell everyone who's with us today how grateful we are to have you with us. And I <laughs> hope you've been as uh, um, as impressed as I have by everything that's gone on. Anthony, you did an outstanding job and so did our panel. Thanks.